This video is brought to you by Sultan Al Sharif. Thank you so much for donating. If you want to support Brackies yourself, you can go to patreon.com slash Brackies. Thanks for tuning in at Brackies. Hello everyone, welcome to the live stream. Today we are going to be creating one of those um, physics balancing 2D racing games uh, that you often see on uh, mini clip sites with uh, small games. And it's really fun thing to do, it's been around forever. And now with Unity, they've made it super easy. We are going to be using the wheel joint 2D component to easily do this kind of spring um, uh, physics. And um, yeah, so we're going to be doing a bit of scripting. We're going to import a bunch of elements that I will make sure to make available for you uh, through a GitHub download once we're done. I'm going to upload this to YouTube along with the project so you can play around with every everything yourself. And um, then we're going to be doing a lot of setup uh, inside of uh, Unity. So really exciting. And I'm just going to have a sip of Coke here um, before we get started. And uh, let's just jump right into it. So what I want to do is uh, begin by creating a new project. So uh, the demo scene here, we just check that out. And you can see how this is working. We have some uh, live crates and we have this um, bouncing car and at the end we have a cool looking flag uh, which currently does nothing and then when we land on our head the game restarts. So that's what we'll uh, be making. So let's go to file, a new project and uh, let's create a totally empty project here and let's place it in our projects folder wherever that is on your system. I'm going to switch to 2D here and I'm going to name this um, balance uh, racing game and let's hit uh, create project and I'm just going to save that and let's wait for unity to uh, create all of the necessary files in order for this to function and that might take a little while but it shouldn't be too bad and as you can see I've pre prepared some different graphics here I've prepared a car a crate a goal a map and a sky and we're go just going to be using those I'm not going to show you how to uh, create those um, it's really simple stuff all of it and I am again going to make this available to you once I um, upload it to YouTube so you will get your hands on these but it's really something that you can just google your way to or open GIMP and use uh, something really simple. So the first thing that we kind of want in here in our empty project is um, well a map so let's start by uh, importing our map here. And this is a Photoshop file. You can use PNGs or JPEGs or whatever. And um, we'll also need a sky to have a nice looking background. So let's take these two files and let's drag them inside of Unity and wait for it to import. And we'll select both of them and turn them into sprites. I can see it's already done that for me. That's because I selected 2D by default. Just make sure you change it to that. And um, everything else looks pretty fine, except our map here is actually pretty huge. So I'm just gonna bump up the max size and I'm also going to make this a true color. I don't want any compression on this asset. Um, so everything else looks good, except I want to uh, decrease the pixels per unit to make it bigger inside of the game. And I also want to do that to the sky. So I want the sky here to be really, really big. Uh, it's not uh, that big in terms of pixels. It's only 400 by 225. So let's just uh, increase the pixels per unit here to really blow it up. So now we can take our map and we can drag it in here. And you can see we have this huge looking map already and it's, uh, it looks quite fine. And uh, what we really just need is a sky behind it. So let's take our sky, drag that in as well. And you can see it fills up our entire main camera. And we are going to be moving around our main camera. So let's just make sure to parent our sky to the main camera as a child object. So we can now move around our main camera and the sky will move with it. That means that our sky is totally static, but because it's so blurred out, uh, you aren't really going to notice it. So what we can do then is just adding a few sorting layers here. We're going to have one for the background. We're going to have one for the default and we're going to have, actually, I don't think we're going to be needing anything in the foreground. So we'll just have those two and we'll take our sky here and add that as the background layer. So that just makes sure to sort it um, behind our map. So now we can drag in, or actually let's just save our level here and save it as something like main level. Uh, it's not really important what you call it. And uh, now we're ready to import our car. So um, let's take our car PSD and drag him in as well. And uh, let's just drag him into the project panel. Again, we want him to be a sprite. So in case he's not, just uh, quickly adjust 
uh, that. And I think he's going to be fine with the default settings. Uh, one thing that you might want to do, I think he's a bit blurred out here, is go in here and uh, toggle off uh, mid maps. I'm just going to do that. That kind of, uh, kind of makes him look a lot more crispy. Uh, cool. So we're going to need some wheels on this guy. But first, let's make him actually interact um, in the physics space. So let's add a component to him. And we're going to be adding the rigid body to D. And this is what, of course, you use whenever you want something to move uh, using Unity's built-in physics system. Also, if you're going to be moving around objects, it's a good idea to just add a rigid body anyway because Unity will be doing some optimizations on that object. Just make sure to then tick is kinematic. So whenever you're dealing with, uh, with moving objects that has anything to do with the uh, physics system, you really want a rigid body there. Um, so let's also add a box collider 2D. And uh, let's quickly adjust this. And you might have a hard time seeing this. So um, what I actually can just do is just disable the sky so you can more clearly see the green bounding box here. And let's edit this collider. A lot of people just adjust these values, but you can actually just hit this edit collider and then drag it down yourself. So of course, this isn't going to match up completely and you could use a polygon collider if you want something more precise but i've been playing so much around with this car and i haven't noticed it one bit so this is a lot more effective so we're just going to be using this we're also going to be adding um another box collider for uh triggering whenever we uh hit our, our head into something um, where we want to restart our game uh, but right now we'll just uh, leave that and we'll add it in a second instead Cool. So let me just have a look at the chat here. Everyone's doing great. That's awesome. Where can you find the assets? The assets are made by um, by me just very quickly and they will be on the YouTube channel once the uh, video goes up, which is hopefully tomorrow. Uh, and uh, yeah, is it like going to be like Hill Climb? Um, I don't remember that game, but it sounds like something that might overlap with this. It's very Happy Wheels-like. It's probably the biggest game that overlaps with what we're doing here. Um, so yeah, awesome. And yeah, I will be doing a Q&A towards the end. Cool. So um, what we can do now is just uh, try and hit play and we will see that our player falls down. But of course, we need him to also collide with our environment. So first of all, one thing that I just remembered is we want to bump up his order and layer so that he's always on top of our um, of our uh, map here. So let's go to our map and let's add a collider to this as well. And this is not going to be a bug collider. We want to go into physics 2D and find the polygon collider 2D. And that will automatically generate a pretty nice looking polygon collider uh, that fits our environment here. So what we can then do is maybe just offset this a tiny bit because it, uh, as you can see, it creates this uh, collider in a way that leaves a gap between uh, the car and the environment. So let's just offset this by something like negative 0.1 on the Y. That's going to make it look a lot better. Just like that. That's actually pretty good. And uh, now we are ready to add some wheels. So again, I've created a wheel sprite here and it's actually not in here, but I have created it. I just didn't remember to put it inside of this folder. So let me just find it on my system here. So under projects, under the um, racing game that I just uh, showed you, I made a wheel PSD here. So let's just take that in there as well. Awesome. So now we can drag this inside of our project panel and uh, everything should line up in terms of scale and settings. Uh, again, one thing we might want to do is just uh, disable mid maps just to make it more uh, crisp and clear. And our wheel should definitely overlay our car. So uh, as the ordering layer, we're going to be put on uh, two here. And we also make it want to make it a child of the car object. And I'm going to move it uh, to fit right around there and also over here and don't worry this is something you can very easily adjust at a later point and it's some, definitely something that you should play around with because it has a lot of effect on uh, how the game actually plays uh, the further apart the wheels are the most uh, more stable uh, everything is going to feel uh, because uh, you're spreading out um, uh, all of the weight uh, cool 
So yeah, that looks good. And what we can then do to the wheels is of course add um, circle collider. So we can go under physics 2D and add a uh, circle collider to those. We can also uh, decrease the radius on that to something like 0.2. Uh, and this way, everything just looks a bit better down here, as you can see. And right now, you will notice that the movement here is very stiff. That's because we still haven't added um, the actual wheel joint 2D component, which is the magical component that will make everything feel awesome and fun. Um, but uh, for initial setup, this looks just fine. And I believe that we need to add rigid body... Uh, bodies to these wheels as well. We do. So let's go under rigid body 2D and let's change the mass here to something like 0.5 and everything else I believe you can just leave as is. Then we can take our car here and change the mass of him to let's say 2 just to make uh, there's a different masses. And right now you can see this is of course causing some problems because they aren't attached anywhere. And normally you really shouldn't uh, nest rigid bodies. You shouldn't have a, a rigid body where child objects has have rigid bodies as well. But because we are going to be hooking this up with the component that kind of requires it, um, we do that. Cool, so let me look in the chat here. Hey everyone, um, uh, do 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 do. Uh, yeah, yeah, the point of this stream is making a complete uh, game tutorial in one stream. That's totally true. I'm pretty much just um, doing a live tutorial and then towards the end we'll do the Q&A. So looking forward to that, of course. Awesome. So why did you add a rigid body at the wheels? That's because it's required uh, by the component that we are going to be using in just a moment. Uh, but normally it is kind of uh, bad to do that. All right, so let's just uh, continue. I'll take a sip of this so I don't sound like a very old person. And we can continue. So um, on our car here, we want to add two new components. So let's do that. We are going to go into Physics 2D. We're going to scroll down and find the wheel joint 2D. And we're actually going to add this twice. Um, and maybe we, yeah, let's just go ahead and add another one. So let's ju just search for wheel joint 2D and let's set these up. So uh, we want to link each of these to our two wheels. So let's first rename these. This is going to be our wheel um, back and this is going to be our wheel underscore front, not Freud. It's going to be front and let's drag this in. So we'll have our back wheel and we'll have our front wheel. And the way that we are going to set things up is um, having the uh, car powered by both wheels. So they're go both going to be connected to the motor. Uh, but you could easily just disable one of them, just remove some of the code and uh, only have it powered by the uh, back wheel or the front wheel. You can do a lot of stuff with this. It's super easy to set up. So what we then want to do is uh, move the anchor point of these wheels. So you can see that I can move this anchor over and we want this of course to sit at the current center of our wheel so that when a wheel gets out of position it is going to try and get back to that point by applying forces. And um, we want to do that with the other wheel as well. So as you can see we can move this anchor too and we just want to drag that down here so that that again when it gets out of position is going to try and get back to that point. Cool. Um, and then we can uh, play around with some of the values here. Most importantly is everything under suspension. So the suspension is of course um, what allows us to have these wheels act actually act as uh, physics objects instead of just being very static. This is what uh, gives this bouncing effect and what applies forces to get the wheels into position. So the damping ratio is how much the wheels are actually going to uh, move. We are not going to actually uh, edit that. That's fine at 0.7. The frequency is kind of how quickly they are going to move back to the position that they should be in. So the frequency in hertz for the oscillation of the suspension. And that sounds really hard to understand, but let me just show you instead what this looks like. So if we now hit play, you can see that our, our car actually always, already rolls away as soon as we hit play. So what we can do, say we lower the frequency here, set it to something like um, 0.5 for both of the wheels. 
that should make the spring here way looser. So you can see here now that our car just totally sinks in. And if we then increase the frequency to something like 10, which is a pretty extreme value, you can see that it goes back up and we have this very stiff spring uh, that uh, isn't quite as bouncy. So I think a good default value for this is around four uh, to give kind of a nice bouncy effect, but still have a lot of control because the more bouncy it is, the harder it is to move around. And um, yeah, so I think this is really good. Then what we also have is a motor. And we can toggle this on and off by uh, toggling the use motor. And we have some settings for this. And that's just a motor speed, which is the speed at which our motor will rotate. And you can see that is in meters per second or degrees per second. And we also have a maximum motor force. And this is the point where we are not, or this is the amount of force, the maximum force that we want to apply in order to try and get the mode of speed that we specify up here. We're just going to leave the maximum motor force, but the motor speed is what we'll be modifying through a script. So that's going to depend on our user input. And you can see right now what happens if I go in here and modify that motor speed. So right now you can see that our, our car doesn't go rolling off. And the reason why is that I've currently enabled the motor here. And that means that the motor down here is trying to stay at a speed of zero. And this is the back wheel. If I then increase this, you can see, and that's actually backwards, that it will try and move at that speed. However, because uh, of um, physics not always doing what you want, uh, the, the car is just going to go sliding uh, because the friction of these isn't, well, infinite. It is going to just slide away and generate some heat down here, but Unity doesn't include that. So what we can also do is hit play and do a negative motor speed here, which is going to drive us forwards. So you can see as I decrease the motor speed here, it's going to uh, make a forwards movement and you can see what that does. Awesome, so this is why we are going to be toggling the motor on and off, uh, depending on whether or not we want to move. And if we want to move, then we are going to toggle it on and adjust the motor speed uh, to whatever speed we determine and also uh, to uh, fit the direction that we want the player to drive in. So that's what we're going to be making now. So in order to do this, let's create a component on a car here called something like car controller. Let's just create that as a C sharp script and let's double click this to open it up in Visual Studio. And again, I'm going to have a sip of code. Ah, oh, lovely. Not sponsored by the way. <laughs> and then we have a look at the chat. Everything's looking good. Awesome. Uh, when's the next uh, multiplayer FPS video coming out? When I make one, I haven't actually prepared the next video yet. There's a tower defense, uh, hopefully later today. This one is going to come out hopefully tomorrow and I will have a look at the multiplayer FPS, but um, I have something larger that I'm working on that is kind of taking time away from the multiplayer FPS series. I'm sorry, they will come back. Uh, in uh, and and redeem itself. Um, we'll have a look at that soon. Uh, but I don't have a an ETA for the next video there. And uh, yeah, let's just continue. So as you can see here, um, we have this car controller, and uh, we just want to access the wheel joints and change around some parameters on the motor. So first off, we need of course a variable to determine the speed at which we want to move. So let's make a public float here and call this one speed and set it to something like, and this is actually going to be a fairly large number. Uh, so something like 1500 by default. And um, the way that we're going to be doing this is inside of the update method is where we will get some user input. And then inside of the fixed update, Inside so the fixed update is where we will actually um, do the movement. So inside of our update here, we can get our current um, movement up and down is going to adjust forwards and backwards and left and right is going to uh, tilt the car. So in order to get our forwards and backwards, meaning up and down, we are going to use input dot get axis and we are going to get the raw axis here and we're going to get the vertical axis. And this means that we are getting a value between negative one and one, and it's going to be zero if you don't press a key, it's going to be one if you press up, 
and negative one if you press down. So what we can use this for is um, um, setting our motor speed equal to this value and then multiplying it with our speed in order to get, well, in order to control how fast we want the car to move. So let's first off store this in a private variable and this is going to be our movement. And let's just default that to zero. And we are simply going to set movement movement equal to input dot get access raw vertical. Let's also multiply it with speed. And because we know that a positive value moves our car backwards, let's also put a minus here uh, so that we reverse that situation. Then we can go into our fixed update and we can access the wheel. So let's create a reference to that wheel. So we'll create a public and this is going to be a wheel joint 2D and this is going to be our back wheel. Then we can go down here and we can say back wheel dot motor and we want to access the motor speed but we can't actually change this directly. We want to set this equal to movement. We cannot do that. And the reason why motor is a struct so it contains all kinds of information and we can actually only change it if we create a new struct populate it with the information that we want and then put it back in. So we can in access individual parameters, but I'll show you how to do this. So what we want to do is essentially create a struct, which is, uh, and now I have to check what the name of the struct here is. So back wheel that motor, this is a joint motor 2D. That's the name of the struct data type that is containing all of the information about a motor. So our joint motor 2D, and we're just going to call this one motor, equals a new joint motor 2D. And then we can do this. And this means that we can just set parameters directly. And you can see we have two parameters here that we can set. First off, we want to set our motor speed equal to our movement. Next off, and we do a comma here, we want to set our max motor torque equal to well, what it already was. We really don't want to uh, uh, edit that. So we're just going to go back wheel dot max uh, dot motor dot max motor torque. And that should be all. Or you could just put in here uh, the value, some kind of uh, value that you hard code in. Or of course you could make it, um, oops, like this. Or you could, of course, uh, make it available as a variable up here. I'm just going to set this to 10,000 because I believe that's what it was inside of our uh, back wheel here. So let's find it. That is 10,000. So I think we're just going to leave it at that, uh, but you can play around with it. So now all we need to do is actually access our back wheel and say back wheel dot motor equals and then the new motor that we just created. That's it. So all we need to do now is um, on top of editing the movement, we also need to toggle the motor on and off because if we now go inside of Unity, you should see, and I think that we of course need to assign this variable. So we need to find our car controller and drag in our first uh, wheel joint here, hit play. You should see that the uh, motor speed here changes as we move. So that's awesome, but it isn't really doing anything. And the reason for it, or it is actually doing something, but it's never snapping out of this use motor mode. And we want that to be, um, actually it is, but it's just enabling it and it's not disabling it again. All right, so for some reason, Unity enables that by default when you declare new struct, uh, don't ask me why. So what we really want to do is check whether or not we should currently be moving. So we just wanna go, if movement is equal to zero, well, in this case, we don't want to have a motor applied. So we just want to go back wheel dot motor or dot use motor and set that to false. And in case that case, we actually want to move. So if that movement value is larger than or smaller than zero, then we want to go back wheel dot use motor and set that to true. And only in this case, we want to go in and actually uh, do all of this stuff. And right now we're only using the back wheel. So you can see now that our car will only be drew, driven by the back wheel. And I'm going to add the other wheel in just a moment, but just to show you that this is working so we can ignore this one. It doesn't use the motor until we actually tell it to, and it went off the screen there, until we tell it to by moving the car. And you can see that it's, it's really spinning the wheel quite fast here, but it's not going that many places. And the reason why is because of friction. 
this scene is currently almost frictionless. Uh, you can see that our wheel is just spinning around, but it's not really getting much done. So what we need to do is add more friction between the map and the wheel. And we do this using something Unity called a physics 2D material. So let's create one of those. Let's create one from for the map. And let's create one for the, uh, let's go, where is it, where is it? Physics 2D material, let's create one for the wheels. So for our map here, let's set, set the friction to something like uh, one. And let's do the same with the wheels. That's quite an uh, increase in friction. And it's definitely, it's not necessarily realistic, uh, but it is what many of these games uh, uses or use um, in order to get that nice effect where you have a lot of control and where if you're good enough, you can almost drive uh, in a vertical position. So that's a lot of fun to play around with. And this also allows you to create easily create a, an ice map where you don't have that much control by simply going in and changing the friction on the map to zero. And now everything is just going to slide around. So let me show you this. So let's find our map and let's find our material here and let's drag our map into that one. And of course, it's not the sprite renderers material, it's the colliders material. Let's do the same thing on the two wheels, except we drag in the wheels. Awesome, let's hit play. And actually, I think I wanna do this to the car chassis as well. So let's just drag in our wheels here as well. That's going to be fine. Cool, so now you can see that we can actually control this. I mean, if, if the, he, uh, the hill is too steep, we don't have that much control, but it is a lot better than before. And we are actually now able to climb this hill here uh, using that system. Awesome, and we have a bit of weird things going on here, and that might be because we are colliding with ourselves. So in order to get rid of the internal collisions here, in case the wheel join uh, doesn't do it, which I found that sometimes it does not, uh, what we can do is simply uh, put these on different layers. So let's take our car here, add a new layer, and this is going to be our car uh, base, and this is going to be our car wheels. And we can take our two wheels and add the car wheels layer. And we can take our car and add the car base layer. And we don't want to change the children there. We want it to be that object only. That should fix some of that stuff. Awesome. So that's already really fun to play around with. And again, if we want to make a snow ice level, let's set the friction to zero. And now you can see that we are totally helpless. We're just going to go sliding off. Cool. So um, the next thing that we want to add is some um, uh, torque on the front wheel as well. And that's done in the exact same way. We just go in, add the front wheel here, front wheel, and we just go here and do all of the same stuff. So we go, uh, whoops, and we of course need a semicolon there. Don't know why I did, uh, didn't do that. So front wheel, use motor, false. And all of the same stuff here, we're going to set front wheel dot use motor to true and down here we want to set front wheel dot motor equal to the same motor so we want the same torque on both of them and now when we play or of course we have to drag it in so we might get some errors here okay it didn't hit play so we can drag in the secondary wheel joint and we should now be able to uh, move using both wheels Woo! that's awesome but we easily tip over. So what we need to now add is some way for us to kind of tilt our car forwards and backwards. So we need to add some rotational torque. And uh, before we do that, let me just have a look in the chat. Yes, I'm going to upload this video to YouTube. Uh, a lot of people saying yes down there. Uh, it's awesome. Thanks for helping out with answering some of this stuff. Um, what... Uh, let's see, what's the difference between fix update and regular update? So regular update is called um, every uh, time the computer draws a frame. So that's a graphics thing. When we draw a new frame, which means uh, 60 times a second, 120 times a second, um, often a lot of times a second, um, that update loop is going to call. Uh, and uh, that is the mo most frequent update. 
and then fixed update is in on a constant time because uh, the update might vary depending on your computer settings how much load it's under how much it needs to uh, draw stuff like that fixed update will always render at a constant time so at a constant interval and that can depend from system to system or game to game but once you've opened up the game it's never going to change and that's uh that's why we do uh, physics stuff in there because you can always count on it uh, having the same amount of time between each step and you can have your physics code run at a separate um uh, on a separate rate than uh, all of your graphics code so you can have your graphics code run really fast and not do physics iteration every time that could be really taxing or in case you're doing a lot of graphic stuff you could have on uh, the physics stuff do a lot of calculations uh in between frames in order to get more um more um precision and uh, then you can update your graphics um more slowly say 30 th times a second whereas the physics might want to update 120 times a second so that is the different uh, the difference between the two i hope that makes sense uh, awesome. Yeah, so let's jump back into creating the game. Um, so in order to do this, all we really need to uh, do is just add some force to the base of our car because our wheels are going to uh, go or just follow the, the base of our car. You can see here if we hit play and move the car here, the wheels just follow it. And the same thing if we rotate it. So um, what we then do is go into our car controller and we add another uh, thing to our update. Now we want to get input.getAxis. And this time I don't want it to be, actually I want it to be raw. And uh, the difference between get access and get access raw, get access does a bit of smoothing on your input and can sometimes feel nicer, but not as respondent. Uh, respondent. And get access raw is only the raw value between, uh, and not any smoothing. So that means either negative one or one. So um, here's going to be the horizontal axis and we're going to store this in another private float and this is going to be our tilt or rotation. I'm just going to do rotation and we want to default that to zero as well. So now we can set rotation equal to that and we can use it down inside of the fixed update and we want to do this regardless of uh, if we're moving or not. So let's just do that at the end of the frame and uh, we're simply going to rotate uh, rotate it by going of course we need a reference to our physics component so um, we could either get that using a reference up here so requiring require component type of rigid body 2d that's going to make force unity to actually have a rigid 2d rigid body 2d component on the same object as the car controller and then we could use get component or we could just do the same thing that we've been doing all along, which is just making a bunch of public components here that we can drag in uh, side of the inspectors. So let's do that. So let's have this be our, our RB for rigid body. And all we do here is simply go RB dot add torque, which is rotational force. And the amount of torque we want to add is rotation. And I believe we need to flip the direction of that. And then of course we need a speed amount uh, so we're going to create another public float and this is going to be our rotation speed and we're going to default that to about uh, 15. I'm going to put an F there as well. And we want to multiply that down here. So that is the rotation speed. Awesome. And we want to multiply this with time.fixed delta time. Right? Yes, we do. Awesome. So now let's try and hit play and we probably want the rotation speed here to be a lot greater. Actually, we need to drag in uh, the rigid body here in order for this to work. And let's see if this is working. So yeah, right now I'm pressing the keys, but not much is happening. And that is definitely because we want to bump this up. So let's try 1500, might be too much. It's actually really fun, but I think it's a bit too much. This is, yeah, you can really do a lot of flips like this. Let's try like a thousand or maybe, maybe 800, not 8,000. You're crazy. That wouldn't be good. Let's try 800. Uh, okay. Didn't get to test that really. Um, we could either zoom out the camera, or just use the scene view here. We'll be making a character controller in a second or camera controller in a second. Yeah, I really like the feel of this. Um, you can always play around with, with it more, but I think it's working quite well right now. So that's awesome. Um, so 
Next up, we're going to be um, adding a camera follow and I'm going to enable the sky here again so we can see things and they look nice. Uh, so next up, yeah, uh, is a camera controller uh, that follows our car around. And then finally, we are going to be adding uh, some crates and a trigger for whenever we land on our head. But first, let me have a look at the chat again. Uh, a lot of people discussing Coca-Cola. Uh, that's awesome. What, um, see here, this is the greatest car control of all time. Thank you. Uh, that's awesome. Um, let's see. Yeah, nothing stressing as far as I can see. Make an RPG tutorial, maybe at some point, uh, right, not right now. Uh, yeah, let's just continue. Most of this stuff is about Coke anyways. Cool. So, camera movement. What do we want to do? Well, the most simple form of camera movement is always just parenting the camera to the car. But you can quickly see, and then positioning the camera to be on the car. But you can quickly see why this is a problem when we have something that rotates. This really, really quickly becomes very funky. And this can be a challenge, of course, but it's kind of way too crazy. This is not a good idea. I get seasick already. So what we really want to do is have our camera using a script only follow the position of our car. So let's create a new component here and let's call this one uh, camera controller. And let's just hit create an ad. And we can double click that to open it up in Visual Studio. And this is a lot easier to program than what we were just uh, doing, don't worry. So we'll just be making a public transform. And this is a reference to the target that we want to follow around. And we'll be making that reference inside of the inspector. So now we can just save that. We can go into the inspector here and we can drag in our car as the target. Then inside of the fixed update me uh, method here, we are going to set our position, so transform.position equal to the target.position. So we're just going to set our position equal to the same position as our car. However, there's one slight problem with this, and that is the fact that we are also using the Z component here. So uh, right now we just snapped our camera in when it really needs to be out here, it just snapped it in and that means that we can't really see anything that's going on. So in order to change this, what we do is we create, we store uh, the position of our target in a vector 3. So this is going to be our new position or target position. And we set that equal to target.position. And then we set new position.z, only that coordinate, equal to negative 10. And then down here, we set our position, transform.position, equal to the new position. So we store it in a temporary vector 3. We edit the Z component to pull our camera back so we can see everything. And then we set our position to that new position. So let's try and hit play here. And now you can see we have a very, very simple camera follow script. And you can add lerping to smooth out the following and everything to make this look and feel super awesome. But really, I like this very responsive camera. And because we have so much bouncing in the car already, I don't think we need much smoothing. So that was the camera script, uh, quick and easy. And let me just check the chat again here. Uh, uh, let's see. Um, is there any option if there are multiple random dot range not give the same numbers? I'm not totally sure what you mean here. Um, random dot range is not instanced the same way that the C sharp random generator is. So that should give you uh, random numbers each time. But what you can do is uh, specify a seed. Uh, so you can give random dot range a seed, which means a number that if you use that multiple times, it's going to produce the same numbers. But as soon as you change the seed, it's going to give you a new number. Uh, but by default, it should just give you random numbers each time, no matter where and how many times you use it. Um, am I going to do a backflip slash, slash uh, front flip reward? Not right now. Uh, that is a bit more complex. You would have to do some checking uh, to uh, see whether or not the user actually does that. And that code could quickly become bit complicated. I'm thinking about how to do that. Um, so not at the moment, but 
Um, you can definitely experiment with that on your own. You just have to keep track of the uh, car's rotation and um, add an event if that increases. Uh, yeah, it's actually not totally easy to do, but it is doable. Uh, but not for this video, I'm sorry. Um, some stuff about how I learned Unity and stuff like that. We are going to take that uh, at the end of the stream where we're going to do a QA. and a It's going to be a lot of fun. I'm sorry that I'm not going to answer that kind of stuff right now. This is Unity 2D, totally correct. Uh, all of the graphics are done in Photoshop and will be available with the YouTube upload. And um, will you make the levels randomly generated? Again, I could. That could be a lot of fun. I can't fit that into a single live stream. If it's something you really want to see, like randomly generated stuff, let me know and I might do a YouTube series uh, on it at some point, uh, but not today. So, yeah. Uh, and also, uh, this here is just a static sprite created in Photoshop. If you want to make this uh, procedural or easier to manipulate inside of the Unity editor, there are a lot of really cool plugins for this on the store, on the asset store. They're not free. And I even searched around for a free alternative uh, to show you uh, here, uh, but I couldn't actually find anything that was updated there. I found a single one, which is, I believe it was called like ED2 or E2D or something like that. Um, and for endless terrain 2D or something. Um, but it was just, the code was too old and not maintained. So um, yeah, I couldn't really get it to work. I would have to write, rewrite a lot of stuff. So uh, but there are definitely assets for that on the store. So let's continue. So the next thing that we want to create is some kind of punishment for whenever we land on our head. So uh, let's take our car and let's move him down to the beginning of our map. And let's move the camera with him. And let's now focus on our car and let's add a new uh, box collider 2D. So yes, we have multiple box colliders, but that's totally okay. Let's going to move. Uh, let's go ahead and move this up as well. There we go. So they're sitting in the same place. And this one we want to be a trigger, and we also want to edit the collider so that it just uh, kind of uh, goes around the head of our player. Uh, so again, I'm going to just quickly disable the sky here, and let's uh, hit Edit Collider and drag this in. So position it somewhere around there. Whoops. Let's try that again. And here, move it down and move it over. And something like this looks pretty good. The colliders are overlapping a tiny bit. So what we'll do is we'll take the car collider here and actually move that down a tiny bit. I think that's going to be fine. Something like uh, that. And you can of course go in and add a polygon collider again if you want it to be more detailed. So I really like this. Um, and what we'll then do is utilize the fact that this is a trigger. So we'll create, you could use the car controller, but we'll create a separate component, which is something like, like um, end game. Or uh, we could also make it something like a game manager, but let's just call this end game. Um, and all this is pretty much going to do, if we open it up, is whenever something enters our trigger, so on trigger enter 2D, this is called every time a collider enters the trigger, then we want to uh, restart the game. So we want to be using Unity Engine dot scene management up here. This will allow, allow us to load new scenes or reload the current one. And we want to go scene manager dot load scene. And the scene that we want to load is the currently active scene. So let's go scene manager dot get active scene. And then we want to get the build index of that uh, because the load scene doesn't take an actual scene. It only takes either a build index or a name. So we can just save that now and uh, we should see that as soon as we start the game, it restarts. Actually, it did not, but they are overlapping. But the problem here is um, if we have something else hit the, um, the player, uh, the trigger here should pretty much uh, be called uh, no matter what hits us, not only if it's the map, also if it is our own car here. If I try and re-enable this, actually it doesn't do that. That's really weird. If I try and offset it, make... I'm really impressed by this. So it doesn't do it with uh, uh, internal colliders apparently. So let's just try and make a new 2D sprite here. Just select some uh, default sprite, some UI sprite. Let's just add a component to this. So let's add a collider box collider 2d and we should see there you go 
So it, it pretty much registers with everything. So what we could do here is um, just have the car uh, not collide with itself. So what we do is we go under uh, edit and then project settings and then go under physics 2D and we go in here and we say, well, the car base, we don't want that to be able to collide with uh, the wheels and we don't want the car wheels to be able to collide with uh, themselves. And um, we don't want the car base to collide with the car base. So there we go. So now nothing on this car should collide. So we can just hit play and everything should work fine and dandy. And if we now jump on our head, you can see that the level indeed does restart. So that is pretty much all of the core functionality that I wanted to put into this game. I also want to uh, show how I uh, added some uh, fun physics crates. And let's also add like a finish flag down here. And we can maybe even do a quick trigger on that just to show you how that's done. So um, uh, again, I'll have a look in the chat and we'll continue. Why not use a solid color for the background? Could totally do that. I just wanted a bit more detail. It might be hard to see on the uh, Twitch stream, but there is actually a bit of clouding uh, inside of this. And I just think it looks a bit nicer. Uh, why not a circle collider? You could totally use a circle collider. Uh, there's no issue with that whatsoever. I just wanted to make it a bit tall and you can't really do that with a circle collider, but you might be right that it's better. Um, so I'm uh, going to put it online when it's finished. Totally. I'm going to put it on a GitHub and on the YouTube page uh, as a separate video, um, but only tomorrow. I think it's because you're using on trigger enter. Nothing is entering it. Well, I tried kind of moving the collider around to see if it would um, would enter, but uh, for some reason it it didn't really do it. Uh, but sometimes Unity does that. It's it's kind of hard to to know when when Unity is uh, uh, is entering something and and stuff like that. What you really want to do is just be safe uh, by disabling that kind of collision. Um, why using polygon colliders, colliders instead of edge colliders? Super good question. Uh, not for any particular reason. You could go in here and use an edge collider 2D. And uh, the only reason uh, why I used a polygon collider is because it just sets itself up. Uh, in here, you really have to go in and, and edit it yourself. And you could totally do that. It doesn't take long. Uh, but there's no automatic way to do this. So I just wanted to use the polygon collider. But if you're really, um, really um, uh, interested in getting this as performant as possible, use the edge collider. That's totally true. Um, how do I activate the full screen game view while I'm not playing? Well, you can go up here and right click and hit maximize, or you could just use shift space. This is some of the most awesome, uh, this is probably the most awesome Unity uh, shortcut and one of the least well known. If you just shift space over any view whatsoever, it's going to maximize it. It makes it so easy. Uh, for example, inside of the animator, sometimes you have hugely complex stuff inside of the animator and you don't have multiple screens. Well. In case you're on a laptop or well, if you don't have like a multi-screen setup, you can just hit shift space and easily focus on whatever it is. Just tab out. It's it's so awesome. It's a really, really good um, uh, shortcut. Um, off topic, do I use SSD or HDD? I use both. I have two SSDs. I have one for uh, my Windows system uh, and I have one for uh, video editing on and doing stuff like that and then I have one hard disk drive for uh, storage and uh, programs uh, or like not so important software. All right, so a lot of questions coming in. I'm sorry, I'm going to continue the video here because it's it's not too good for the YouTube video, so might even cut this out. But um, we'll just uh, finish up the game and we'll do a lot of Q&A. Don't worry about it. I am up for a lot of answering of stuff. I still have more Coca-Cola to go. And I really need to stop saying that brand. I, I need I need, I need, need some money. If you're out there, Coca-Cola, I'm totally willing to do it. <laughs> awesome. So um, yeah, what do we want to do? Let's start with the flag here. Let's just put that in really quickly. Uh, all you want to do is take the uh, flag, the goal here that I created, which you don't have. You can find one on the internet or you can wait for tomorrow. Just drag it in here. Uh, that easy and place it there you go that was all I did for <laughs> the preview video there 
I like it. I like to place it a bit in, uh, into the map here. I think that looks pretty nice. And uh, I'm just going to pause the game here, take our car and drag him over there and replay the game. And you can see how that looks inside of the game. So now let's just make this interactable uh, by on the goal, adding some kind of collider. In our case, we're going to be adding a box collider 2D. And uh, if you haven't noticed, I really like box colliders. And we're going to mark this as a trigger. We're going to add a component. And this is just going to be our uh, goal component. And then double click this to open it up in uh, Visual Studio. Uh, refresh that and we can add a void on trigger enter 2d the exact same way that we did it before however this time i think we need to check if what we're colliding with is actually the player so whenever you only want uh, to collide with one thing one uh, it's really easy to just check for a name or a tag and in our case um we can just tag the car as player or as car. So um, we gather some information about what is currently entering the trigger. To do that, we go collider 2D and we call this colli collision info. I'm just gonna call this call info. And call info now contains information about the name of what we hit, the tag of what we hit, and other stuff like the collider and the game object itself. So now we can simply go if Collider info dot uh, name dot tag is equal to uh, player. Well, then the player hit us and we can continue to the next level. You can continue to the next level since I'm not going to be making a next level. I'm just going to throw in here uh, game one. There we go. So now we have a win state and it's an actual game. And then we can uh, maybe just reload uh, the scene so people can play again because let's face it, this level has infinite replay value. Uh, so let's go in here and import uh, scene management once again. Go scene manager dot uh, load scene. And the scene we want to load is scene manager dot get active scene dot build index. Whoops, we need to specify this as a function dot build index. Close that off. Save the script, done, hopefully, done, let's try. So let's move our car over, let's find our car. There's our car moving over, hit play. This camera snaps over there, let's try and move through this. And it's restarting the scene, but it's not throwing a debug.log statement. That's actually really, really weird. Unity should definitely do this. Is it somehow restarting the level without uh, getting to actually throw the debug.log? That is so weird. And it shouldn't even do this because it's not tagged as player. I have no idea what's going Oh, of course. Of course. So what is happening is our flag isn't firing, but our car is. So we're registering that we're hitting the flag. I'm so dumb. So what we do now is uh, just go inside of, ah, uh, well, how do we get rid of this? Uh, let's see. We can go inside of our end game and we can uh, add a collision info here as well to kind of specify that we don't want to do this if it's the flag. Um, actually, we could also add all of this co code into the uh, end game. Um, there are multiple ways of doing this. I don't really know what I want to do with this. Uh, I think, I don't know. <laughs> I think what we're going to do is go into our end, uh, end game here and add some um, collision info, maybe. Let's see, edit, project settings, physics 2D. So we could of course put the flag here on a separate layer and just uh, disable um, the uh, collision between the two. But the problem here is um, that we are then not going to register whenever the uh, trigger actually enters. So, uh, and a lot of people are saying that I should use compare tag. That's totally true. I should definitely go in here and use dot compare tag. And we want to compare that with the player. I believe that's how you use compare tag. It's one of those uh, little things. It's definitely a little bit faster, but I would, I believe that Unity would optimize that actually behind the scenes but it is better. But we still have our problem here. So uh, what we could go in and do is under our end game here, we could the same way add a collider 2D 
with our collision info. And we could say that um, if our collision info dot uh, layer or dot uh, tag, and again, we do dot compare tag, um, and we could have some kind of tag called collidable, uh, for example, or um, destroys player in game, whatever. We'll just say collidable. Um, then we want to uh, reload the scene. This way we can have objects that doesn't do this and we can specify which objects actually do this. And in this case, we want to, of course, go into our map, add a new tag here, and we'll make this uh, collidable. I believe that is how collidable, collidable, collidable. I believe it's like this. Awesome. Uh, and we can specify that on our map. So change that to collidable. And now we should uh, be able to uh, actually die on a map. Yes, but not on the flag. No, that's awesome. And then what we can do is I want to move this goal in front of our player. So I'm just going to put five here or something. Uh, that looks a bit nicer, I think. Cool. And uh, then finally, uh, what we'll do is... Um, specify the car here as a player so we'll tag that as a player and now we should see that our flag was will fire and it does it says game one so that was the solution for that problem and if you want to be really neat about this you will go inside of the goal and you will wrap this uh inside of some kind of um i enumerator in order to delay the action a little bit and then you can have some text pop up saying game one and then after a certain amount of seconds it will transition to the next level we've done loads of this stuff in the past such as in the 2d platformer course so if that's something you're interested in just go there and check that out cool so that was all the core functionality let's um add in a few crates and we're done so let's take our car here move him back and uh, let's add a crate. So dragging this into the scene, that looks good. We can maybe scale this down a bit because it's currently huge. Uh, so maybe make this of size like 200 pixels per unit. And um, everything else is, is looking fine. We can maybe disable the mid maps uh, and make this true color. And uh, what really what we want to do is just add a box collider 2D, add a rigid body 2D, and I think I want to decrease the mass a little bit to something like 0.3, and that should actually do it. I think this should be interactable now, and we can definitely turn this into a prefab. So let's just organize everything a bit. We'll have a scripts folder, we'll have a uh, sprites folder, we'll have a physics material material folder and yeah so let's take all of our physics materials here move them in under physics mat let's take all of our scripts move that under scripts and let's take all of our sprites and move those you guessed it under sprites come on unity is freezing here let's try that one more time move those under sprites for some reason unity is really bucking out when i try to do this so we'll just go one at a time there we go move all of our different sprites and the end game under scripts cool uh so yeah what we can do with our create is just turn it into a prefab but drag it in here and now we can just distribute this uh throughout the scene so we'll have uh one that sits uh, this one is going to fall down there so we'll have one here that might hit the player and um because we are going to select the tag here as collidable and hit apply uh, this, these are actually going to kill the player. So if he gets hit by a falling crate, it's going to be really, really fun. That's a kind of an evil thing to do. And we can put one at the top of the hill here. And let's now hit play and see how this works. So there is the falling crate. And let's uh, move that up a bit higher and a bit uh, more over so that if you mistime this, you're going to get hit by it. That's awesome. Uh, so yeah, we are going to drive right over that guy. And you can see that we can push these crates around. And you can add, of course, a separate material to those if you want them to have more friction um, and glide more around in the environment. I might actually do that. So uh, that was pretty much the way that I added the crates. And just to uh, finish things up here, let's add a physics 2D material for the crate. Let's drag this under physics mat. Let's uh, drag this onto one of the crates uh, here. Let's hit apply. Let's go under the crate and change the friction to something like, well, 
0.4 is going to be pretty good. Actually, let's try 0.2. And you should see that that makes it uh, slide down the hills and just makes them a, uh, a bit more fun to play around with. So that was pretty much all I wanted to show in this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, as, um, as we're just trying this out in full screen and seeing if everything is working. And um, yeah, I think we're pretty much ready to jump over to Q&A mode. I'm really, really happy with these results. Again, um, I'm sorry that I didn't provide a link to, whoops, kind of getting stuck here. Oh, there you go, I fixed it. And to all of the sprites, but I will definitely upload those um, to GitHub along with all of the source code and, um, and you can just grab it from there. So I hope you enjoyed making this game and uh, yeah, let's, let's do some questions. Awesome. So let me just transition over here and you should see the Twitch chat here. It's a new layout that I'm trying out. So hopefully this is working. Um, yeah, cool. So let me see questions. Everyone just fire away and we'll have a blast. So how long to the QA session? It's now here. Um, Please somebody suggest me site or video to learn basic game development mathematics. I actually just started a course um, called Game Math Theory that explains some of the uh, very fundamental stuff like uh, vectors, sine waves, and uh, I'm currently working on one explaining um, uh, some a field in applied mathematics, which is forces uh, and, um, well, it's called dynamics. Uh, which is uh, applying forces and torque and stuff like that. Uh, but that's going to be uh, a lot of fun. And uh, you can, of course, suggest uh, other stuff that you want to hear as well. Um, so let's see. Mm. Uh, it's already been... Um, yep, yeah, there will be a replay on Twitch and on YouTube, definitely. Um, first on Twitch and then tomorrow on YouTube. Uh yeah, that's awesome. How do you change the theme in Visual Studio? So you go into Visual Studio, reload all here. Um, it's just in the way. You go um, tools, customize. Nope, tools options. I always forget this. And uh, you can go in here and edit everything. There's so much stuff in here. Also fonts and colors. And you can go in and edit every single thing. But what you normally do is download a theme of uh, some website. There's a lot of websites for this. Um, I'm just going to find the one that I uh, normally use. If you just search for Visual Studio themes. I like to use the one called Studio Styles. StudioStyle.es and uh, there's a lot of stuff here. Just download one and then you double click it in order to import it. So you can go, go to tools, import and export settings. You go to import selected environment settings. You select a file and you can select the different thing, parts of that that you want to import. Um, and one part of it is going to be uh, the styling. Uh, yep. Yeah, so that's how you do that. Um, and I believe that I was in chat mode that entire time. <laughs> So I'm just going to switch over and do that one more time. I'm so sorry. So um, let me just show you this one more time. So we have um, Visual Studio here. Let me open up a script just to find you the panel. Uh, so let's see. This is under tools, options, uh, and you can go under fonts and colors and you can play around with everything. Uh, or you could go tools import and export settings, and you can download a theme of, of a website called Studio Styles, uh, which I will now write in the chat. So let me just do that and you can check it out there. Uh, so I will just write it to you right here. Oh, all of these windows I have opened, it's way too much. So it's called uh, Studio, studio Style.es. There you go. Awesome. So uh, when am I going to upload the project in GitHub? Tomorrow, uh, hopefully. Um, when did I start coding? That's a good question. And it's actually one that's kind of hard to answer um, because it's it's been so long. And also, um, when what is coding really? I mean, I started doing visual coding, actually. Well, that's not totally true. 
I started by making uh, one of those console applications a really long time ago, trying to make a calculator in Visual Basic. But that's so long ago, I don't even really remember how it turned out or if I even finished it. And then I, I moved over to Game Maker, which was a lot of fun, and that does have a bit of um, visual programming. Um, and not the current Game Maker, a very, very old Game Maker that was made by an entirely, entirely different studio. And um, that was a lot of fun. It had some simple sprites and stuff. I could do a bit of movement. Um, and... Then I transitioned over to doing Blender, actually. Um, whenever Blender introduced their game engine, I, I used their visual programming, not any Python. Um, and from there, it pretty much just unlocked the world of programming. I did uh, Unity programming, C Sharp and JavaScript. I've also done some website stuff now, and um, I know a, a fair amount of languages, but a really long time ago with Blender. Uh, but I got into Unity like, I don't know, five year, years ago or something like that. Yeah, uh, maybe even less. No, five years is about right. Cool. Um, have I ever made money off a game? That's a really good question. I've published a lot of free games, but I've actually never monetized them. Uh, in If you follow the channel for a while, you know that I have this thing where I'm really much in love with free stuff. I haven't charged a single thing on the Brackish channel. And I've made a lot of software as well on the on the um, asset store. There's the UPA toolkit. And there's also the very old now inventory system. And everything has just been available for free. So yeah, that's how it is. <laughs> I've done a bit of adware on, on YouTube, but that that's all. Um, see what do i think about python i think it's a great programming language and it's awesome for multiple reasons it's super simple syntax wise it doesn't get easier um that's also sometimes its biggest biggest flaw is is the syntax and how simple it tries to be uh, that's why I get annoyed with it at points. But it can be used for so many things. It can be used for making games. It can be used, uh, it's used by a lot of scientists for um, uh, either doing some processing or for uh, displaying data. Uh, so it's a really, really um, versatile uh, language that can be used in a, in a range of different ways. And it's just so easy to pick up. So I really recommend a lot of beginners uh, to start with um, Python. Um, or Unity, of course. Unity is awesome. But uh, unless you want to get directly into 3D games, uh, Python is a really great way to start. Um, um, my, could you do a my top 10 tips in Unity video? Like the shift space tips you talked about. Would you have some great tricks up your sleeve? Thank you. Um, greetings from Sweden. Um, hi in Sweden. Um, yeah, that's a pretty good idea. I could definitely consider that. I'll put it on the suggestions list. That could be really, really fun. I mean, I would have to think about what I wanted to put on there. But yeah, the shift space one is definitely um, one that should be there. There are some pretty handy uh, Unity things that a lot of people don't know about. Uh, one thing that I've now shown in the videos uh, quite a bit is if I just uh, switch over to Unity here is the um, fact that you can go into debug mode in order to see private variables. That just sped up my process so freaking much if we go into uh, the car for example and have a look at the car controller we have a few private variables here what you can do is just go up here change it to debug and it's going to display those kind of faded but it is going to display them so you don't have to create a separate variable or force them to be public just because you want to view them uh, that's a really handy thing um so let me see what else um in scale from 1 to 10, how hard is Unity C Sharp for me? Um, that's a really hard question. It totally depends on, on what I want to do. I mean, the language itself um, is really just an extension of myself at this point. I've, I've written so much code in, in C Sharp and for the Unity API that um, I pretty much just know what to write and I don't have to look that much stuff up. Um, yeah, but it's just practice and you will get there and it will become easier in the beginning it was totally scary and impossible to do uh, but it gets easier so bring up the twitch chat here um uh what do i do for a living uh i do this i just finished up my education so 
Uh, now I'm full time with Brekkies and it's it's a lot of fun. Thank by the way, thank you so much to all of the Patreon supporters. I haven't made mentioned Patreon all this time. If you want to support uh, me and the the channel and all of the videos and these live streams, these are live streams are only made possible because of Patreon. Uh, you can go to Patreon.com/slash Brekkies. There's um, I normally display a link on the screen, but uh, it should be on the chat somewhere. Um, and uh, you can donate with a monthly recurring donation. It just it means the world. It, it's what makes me able to do this because you need or uh, YouTube AdSense is the rates on that kind of stuff is really really low. So it's amazing uh, if you guys support and uh, thank you so much to pe the people who are already doing that. But yeah, this is my full time job. Um, so. Yeah, a lot of people or some people are asking for the full time uh, for the final game here. So I'm just going to switch over and show it in action. This is the final game. We have the controls working. We have uh, flying crates and this kind of stuff. And oh, I flipped over, right? So I'm actually really bad at this game. And I've always, always been bad at these types of games. I don't know. That's maybe why I wanted to create one myself so I could make it easier. Didn't succeed on that, I guess. Uh, make a mobile RPG tutorial. That's something that I'm not going to do. I'm sorry. Um, RPGs are uh, really content heavy and therefore take a while to create. They also require a lot of programming. You pretty much need a team in order to do an RPG. And uh, for tutorials, that makes things even harder. And mobile is just narrowing things down and making the, the hard to do stuff almost impossible because then you have to worry about optimization and everything. So I'm sorry, that's not something that I'm going to be making a a tutorial series on um what education did i just finish um that is also a good question um, the danish term is gymnasium which is basically the equivalent of uh, high school so yeah just finish that up um what do you think about c++ is it a good programming language this is a very broad question i mean um c++ is great in many ways, because you can get super performant native code. You can your code runs so fast. You have a lot of control, and uh, there's a. I mean, so much stuff is written on C plus plus. So of course, it's a really really good language to know because sometimes you just have to delve into the really hardcore stuff. Um, but it it's also full of pit traps and it's not beginner friendly in any way. And sometimes you just you're scratching your head looking at something for days in order to fix it. Uh, C++ can either be really fun because you make super performing code or a hell because that super performing code can be just as hard to debug. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, am I planning on taking any further education since a gymnasium education isn't sufficient for a job if so what are you thinking i'm not planning on continuing uh, with an education um, for several reasons and uh, the first one is i don't feel like it uh, i i got kind of tired um, with um, my education towards the end I had a, it was a fine uh, place that i went to and everything but um uh, I'm really happy to not be in the educational system anymore. What I really enjoy is making videos for you guys and programming and doing game projects and all of this stuff. All of this interaction is super fun. And I, I just don't have the uh, time and um, uh, I'm not really able to do that if I'm in an education at the same time. So that I would have to sacrifice some of this. And that's not something that I'm really to do right now. But of course... Uh, I might have to do something at some point. So we'll see. Um, am I new here on Twitch? Um, yes, I'm fairly new here on Twitch. This is my third live stream. I do a monthly live stream. Uh, in case you haven't seen the YouTube channel, you can go to youtube.com slash brekkies. Um, I do tutorials. So <laughs> hi to the guys who are discovering me through Twitch. Uh, that is, Twitch is not my primary thing. This is a scary thing. This is odd thing that I only do once a month uh, but it's it's a lot of fun um, fun fact C++ was my first language and it took three months just to get the basics well congratulations that you uh, were able to get the basics in three months uh, some people spend years trying to understand for loops and while loops and memory management I mean uh, C++ is super hard 
Um, how old am I? I'm 19 years old. Um, how do you have multiple people working on the same Unity project at the same time? That's a super good question. Unity has a lot of stuff for collaborating uh, with teams. They have their own um, a version control that allows people to work even inside of the same scene. And that's a super powerful thing, especially because Unity now has um, the ability to load multiple scenes together and have them nest. And that makes it really easy to um, make your game more modular. So have the designer work on one part or have multiple script modules loading in. And uh, what you really want to pick up is just some kind of um, a version control system. And what I would use is uh, GitHub. So I always use GitHub, that's awesome. It makes it easy to just look over what was changed on one side, what was changed on another side, and then merge the changes if they conflict and st stuff like that. It makes things pretty easy to do. But it does require some planning. You do always have to plan for it. Gonna make a 2D platformer fighter game? Already have a 2D platformer series. I know it isn't like uh, melee fighting, but there's gun, there are guns in there and you can very easily just edit that to, um, if you just limit the range, it's basically a fighting game. Then you can add combos and some animations, but all of the other code is totally re reusable. Um, do I know another engine for game development uh, better than Unity? I don't know anything better than Unity, but I know stuff that is better for certain types of projects. I know this stuff that arguably could be just as good. My favorite will always, or is so far, Unity, because it's so easy to change. It's so easy to extend. It's um, awesome for teaching. The scripting system is super solid. Everything in Unity is just a breeze to use, and it's really fun. Um, but if you want to get AAA graphics, you can do that inside of Unity. But if you want something that works just right out of the box, I would recommend picking up Unreal 4, for example. The Unreal Engine is a great place to start if you want to make a, um, a really high quality shooter game, for example. Uh, but it's also a lot harder to use. And I definitely recommend that you only use it if you are in some kind of a team. Because using Unreal as a single person just takes a lot of time. And Unity is fast. So yeah, it's a, it totally depends on your project. Um, uh, do I think that Unity will still be there in uh, 10 years? Yeah, I think uh, the industry in many ways are shifting towards using this kind of middleware that Unity is. This uh, base or this engine with a total, complete, insane editor on top of it. Uh, what uh, people did before was, um, well, there didn't exist many little game studios. All of this indie developer thing is a very new concept. And if they did... Um, and the results that these teams were able to accomplish weren't normally that impressive. Right now, people uh, can, um, even single individuals or teams of four or five people can make really, really high quality games. And that's because of middleware such as Unity. What you did before was have large, large studios where you have a team dedicated to building an engine and maintaining it. Then you have another team dedicated to making editor tools for the artist to use. And then you have a third team for actually making the game. And Unity just takes the two first teams, the ones that build the engine and the ones that make the tools for the artists and almost completely removes that workload. You, of course, you can go in and edit it. And of course, you can extend the editor to do uh, more stuff specific to a game, but it just makes everything so much easier. And I think um, in, in more years uh, or with more years on its back, it's just going to do more. So... Is it possible to build a game without the Unity screen intro? <laughs> totally is. Uh, I do believe you still have to have some kind of Unity subscription in order to get rid of the intro, but you can do that. I don't know if, it, if they changed it, but I don't think they have. Um, they even create a uh, Unity screen intro customization thing uh, that I don't know if it's out yet, but it will definitely come soon so you can um, manipulate how you want to, to use it or how you want it to look. But yeah, you need Unity Pro. Uh, how do you ha save high scores in games so it remembers after a game restart? That depends on uh, if you mean local high scores or networked high scores. Networked, you will have to upload the high scores to some kind of server that you either 
host yourself or rent some hosting space. And uh, most of the time you just save it as a text file, as a um, XML file or as JSON. And um, another way is um, to just save it locally on the system. And um, that means just using player prefs is the easiest. If you search for player prefs, as in preferences, uh, you can um, uh, find the Unity documentation on that. It's a super easy way to save uh, small pieces of data using Unity. Or you could uh, look into saving XML or JSON files uh, locally. So it's called data serialization for a fancy word and you can totally uh, look into that it's not super hard and there's a lot of uh, resources showing how to do uh, local high scores um i didn't take a college with any game design course at all and no i don't mind you asking um so let's see here uh Did I learn English in school or another way of learning? Uh, both. I learned English in school. I wasn't a totally quick learner, but somewhat came around, hopefully. You don't think my accent is too thick. Um, but yeah, I, I learned English uh, through schools and through playing a lot of games and watching a lot of YouTube videos. I was the, one of those kid kids who would sit there and watch Call of Duty videos and um, and learn that way. It was a lot of fun and World of Warcraft was awesome as well. I was kind of addicted to that game. Um, so yeah, playing games. I think of a lot of um, mostly boys learn English that way, at least around here. When you ask around, that's that's how people learn because uh, the, the English that you learn in school is very generic and doesn't really allow you to express yourselves uh it's just yeah learned english through runescape that's awesome uh but that's just very generic conversations like i want to buy an apple <laughs> and stuff like that that's particularly interesting so i'm glad i had a computer um do i think unity would be a good tool to play around with uh artificial neural networks and neural evolution I played around with that um, like last week and it was a lot of fun. Um, I, I just saw a cool video on um, like genetic algorithms and neural networks and, and that kind of stuff. And I thought it looked super cool. So I hopped into Unity and, and tried it out. And yeah, Unity is a great place to do that kind of stuff. Any kind of simulation is awesome to do with Unity. Uh, but Unity is also to, uh, totally overkill for that kind of stuff. You could uh, use Python or something else uh but you can of course do that inside of unity um thoughts on game maker game maker is awesome it's a very simple uh and it's very approachable and a lot of people love it i haven't used it too much i've played a little around in the editor and stuff like that i'm a unity fan <laughs> if you haven't noticed but game maker is great really great uh but only for 2d um uh, any tips or resource if someone wants to understand? Oh, and then the uh, thing that's disappeared off my screen. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, I'm finding the question. Uh, where is it? Any tips or resources if someone wants to get better at understanding game physics and or making their own? I'm making a video for this. So uh, very soon, hopefully, I will have it done. It's another video in the Game Math uh, series um, course. And it's about uh, dynamics, which is a field of applied mathematics, which overlaps with physics, which is about forces, how you apply forces to an object and how gravity works and how those forces translate into motion uh, with concepts like acceleration, velocity and position. So uh, I'm definitely going to show that kind of stuff. And that's going to be a fine place to start. Uh, uh, but yeah, any kind of physics book will teach you the basics and they are pretty easy to apply. I mean, if you have a basic understanding of uh, mathematics and especially if you know what vectors are and how to use them, um, you're going to be fine with uh, doing physics calculations. However, uh, collision detection and that kind of stuff is a story on its own. That's a very program programming specific technical thing uh, but you can of course look that kind of stuff up um uh let me see um 
what is the best way to handle slopes in a 2D game? Um, don't entirely follow what you mean. If you mean like the character falling, you can really what you can do is you can break cast to the surface and you can get an idea of where the surface is pointing and depending on the angle of that surface or that particular edge that you've hit with the raycast uh, you can determine whether or not you want to slide down it or work, walk down it that is the short technical explanation uh, yep yeah. can you do an ai tutorial i'm having f trouble finding a good one i've done some ai tutorials um but ai is a huge broad topic uh i mean when it comes to ai um there's so much you can do and it totally depends on what you want to do AI could be a talking machine, it could be uh, enemies flying around trying to shoot you, and it could be uh, an opponent in chess. Uh, all of that stuff is technically AI. So, uh, But if you just mean like enemies following you around and stuff like that, check out the 2D platformer course. I use the A-star uh, pathfinding algorithm to implement AI. You can also check out Rain from, uh, oh, what are they called? Rain, Rain AI. I have rival theory, right? Those, uh, that's a great and comprehensive AI solution. But really, you probably want to pick up some kind of pathfinding algorithm. Um, you can implement it on your own. Uh, then you can just search for A star. It's very simple. So A star pathfinding algorithm implementation tutorial is what I would type into to Google in order to find that. Uh, but you can check out the 2D platform, of course, for example. Um, Is it worse that I normally only use one scene for my whole game? That totally depends on the scene. A lot of smaller games only need one scene. If you are switching from one environment to another, you probably want to switch scene. Uh, but it totally depends. I mean, if it's performant, it doesn't matter. You can have everything inside of one scene. Um, have I ever been to Germany? Yeah, I love Germany. Um, I've been there loads of times actually my uh, parents when i were uh, i was i was younger had an apartment there where we would go on vacation trips and we went there a lot and we'd rent it out sometimes and um yeah now germany is a blast um i would love to go back soon it's been a long time since i uh, i was there uh, last but yeah it's it's just an awesome place to be um a lot of concerts, a lot of good concert opportunities in Germany. Uh, so if you're a music fan, uh, it's a good place to travel. Um, if I ever participated in any type of computer science contest, not computer science, no. I participated in Ludum Dare, which is a game development competition. And I also did one myself called 10 Hour Games, which was a lot of fun. Uh, but not in anything computer science specific. Um... Um, are we starting or is this already the end? I'm sorry to break it to you. This is the end of the stream, but it will be uploaded to YouTube. You have a few more minutes to ask questions and then I think we're going to close the stream off because then I will have stream for like two hours and I think that's that's enough. My, my voice can't handle anymore. Um, were I in Poland? Never been to Poland. I uh, would like to go. Um, why did you choose Unity? I'm using Unreal Engine 4. Uh, because most of the projects that I want to do is easier to do in Unity. It's faster, it's easier to extend, um, it's very easy to prototype in. Unreal Engine has come a long way since I chose Unity originally as like my main engine that I wanted to do tutorials on and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it totally depends on the project. Do I like game jams? Game jams are awesome. Do you prefer working in teams or alone on game jams? I really like doing like a little project on my own, but I've also done a lot of uh, like uh, time limited project as a team and that can be just as fun. It really depends on what you want to do and, and what you want to get out of it. If you can find someone who is uh, kind of in line with your thing and, and thinking and who you have a great time uh, um, doing this sort of stuff with, you should definitely do it as a team. It's 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 just so much fun. Um, uh, let's see. Am I working on any personal projects at the moment? Um, not too many personal projects. I did a, a, a bit of neuroevolution and genetic algorithms here. Uh, for fun. Also a lot of terrain generation. I've had 
a lot of fun doing that inside of Unity. Um, but really, I've been working on a website, uh, which is this huge new secret thing that you're going to see soon that I'm really, really excited to show you guys. It's going to be, I think you're going to have a blast using it. Um, I can't say too much right now. I don't want to spoil it uh, until it's totally done, but it means free stuff. So that's awesome. <laughs> so I'm really, I'm working on something really big that I've been pouring a lot of hours into. And it's also taken hours away from the multiplayer FPS course. I'm sorry about that, but don't worry. It's, it's not gone. It will be right back. Have I been in Norway? Uh, I don't believe I have. Uh, maybe maybe just traveling through, but I haven't really spent time there. Sorry. Um, how can I learn if I had a have a hard time coding? So uh, you want to program, and it's difficult. It is for everyone in the beginning. No one has an easy time getting into programming. Um, if you have a really really hard time and find you just constantly get stuck, pick up something easier. If you don't start with C plus plus. Um, I think pretty much the easiest thing that you can start with in terms of like real programming and not like HTML, CSS kind of stuff, not just styling, um, would be uh, Python. And uh, then you can move on to Java or C, C Sharp or JavaScript, which is even easier. So I think uh, Python is a great place to start. Or you can start with uh, the Mega Game course if you want to make games that is on my YouTube channel. In the beginning, do a lot of copy pasting and just try. Uh, don't don't you don't have to like write everything yourself. You can just copy things in uh, from the forum or whatever. Just search for the functionality, copy the script, and see if you can make it work. And edit it and tweak a few things and see when it breaks and when it works and when it becomes awesome. Uh, and then later, don't worry, you'll get the hang of it and you will start be able to write code on your own. And that's when it really kicks off and and becomes super fun. But Everyone's been there, having a hard time learning to code. Um, what language do I speak? I speak Danish. That's my primary language. I also speak English, somewhat. <laughs> and I speak a tiny bit of German, but it's embarrassing. So I'm not going to do that. We, just, we get taught that in school. And it's always been kind of the language that I refuse to learn. So <laughs> I'm, I'm in no way going to do that. <laughs> Um, Want to see some more advanced tutorials? It's good to know. Uh, duly noted. Uh, do I study computer science or something in that direction? I don't study at the moment, no. Um, but of course, uh, I study in my free time, uh, just with the internet. There's a lot of stuff out there. Don't need to take an education. Um, uh, people are already asking me to do the, the German thing. Um, um, yeah, yep, I am Danish. Uh, yeah, so I think the questions have plateaued and people are now just discussing languages. So, um, if you have any burning questions, ask them now. I don't have three parents. Uh, if you have any burning questions, serious questions, preferably, <laughs> ask them now or else we are going to close down the, screen, the stream here. So you have, you have one minute, guys. Um, where did I learn to use uh, Unity? Through practice, through tutorials. I, I watched the Tornado Twins back in the day. Uh, that was fun. And um, yeah, lot, loads of practice. Um, you can pick up a book on C Sharp as well if you have a hard time understanding it. Um, but just make some projects. Find something that you want to do and just have a go at it. Don't uh, doesn't matter uh, what it is or if you finish it or not. I think in the beginning, all you really need to do is just jump out uh, jump into it um if i could choose one feature they should implement in unity what should it be jesus christ that's a good question actually i i just uh, got done watching the keynote from uh yesterday and there's a lot of exciting stuff in there right now i think the timeline has been lacking for a long time so that's really really exciting to finally see it that would probably have been my answer um, previously, but now I have to kind of rethink that one. So <laughs> sorry, I don't have a really good answer right off the bat. Um, no, no, I have nothing. <laughs> I'm actually really satisfied with the amount of functionality right now. 
Uh, most of the stuff that I've been asking about has been uh, added or fixed or whatever. So yeah, but you also mostly notice this kind of stuff when you're really uh, deep into working on a game and I'm not working on any big game projects right now. So I don't have anything to complain about just doing tutorials. And that is most of the time just scratching the surface. Uh, what projects are planned in the coming months? Big projects, exciting projects, secret projects coming up. Don't worry. Uh, do I have a girlfriend? Yes, she's sitting next to me and uh, she's the admin here. She's called Sophie Bob. She's saying hi. Uh, she's moderator. Uh, so you will see her in the chat. Um, what was my first game? That was a game called uh, Your Game that I was... Actually, that's not totally true. But my very first game was a console application. Then I did um, a kind of racing-ish physics-based uh, game with just cubes and Blender. I had a lot of fun with that. Did a lot of different stuff in Blender. The first Unity game was uh, something called Awake, which was a horribly, horrible uh, 2.5D platformer. And then I tried to do one called uh, Your Game. Didn't turn out too well, uh, where people could create their own game uh, as a mobile app. Um, so yeah, that was my first like big project. Um, let's see here. Um, thanks to all the people uh, supporting. Thanks to all the people saying great stream. That's awesome. Um, what language do I prefer? C sharp. What language should I learn? That depends on where you are. Uh, if it's your first Python, if you are experienced, um, C sharp. Um, yes, it will be posted on YouTube. Um, nested prefabs. That's a great suggestion. I can't believe I forgot that one. I will now revitalize my answer to nested prefabs. That is the number one thing that I want to see. Jesus Christ, that has been a long time in the process. Um, all right. Uh, by the way, if to those of you who watched the uh, Unity um, presentation, the Unity keynote, I love the joke with the cancel button. If you're a long time Unity user, that was the thing. Like, I think the thing that was most discussed on the forums when that first came out was the was the freaking cancel button, so. Um, do you like visual uh, scripting? No, I like it for beginners. It's a great way to uh, understand the logic, but I really don't like using it. Uh, I like typing, it's a lot faster, and you don't need to move your hands all the way over to the mouse, which can be, oh, exhausting, let's face it. Uh, but it's, it's, it's really great as a learning tool and for artists who refuse to get into the programming side. Um, I say I have a lot of work to do, but I watched a two-hour keynote. I consider it my job to spend time knowing that kind of stuff. Shh. I cut down on sleep, <laughs> honestly. Um, can you give a quick overview on uh, how to do script uh, events in Unity? I'm sorry, that's uh, not right now. It's a bit too late. Uh, but you can just look up scripted events, Unity. There are tutorials there. Um, a lot of them, actually. Uh, I've seen some myself uh, when I first wanted to do that stuff. Um, I don't have time for showing you some of my games. I will do so at a later point, maybe. And um, yeah. All right. I think we're going to close the stream here. How to read my name. We can finish with that. My name is Espion. Uh, but most people just go Asbjorn or something like that. That's fine. Um, the er makes it kind of weird. So... Thank you so much for tuning into the stream, guys. I had a blast. It was so much uh, much fun. I hope you enjoyed uh, the game and the stream and the explanations and the QA sessions. Ah, <laughs> now I'm going to have some sleep. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much for watching. Um, this, was, this was a lot of fun. It will be on the Twitch archive right now in case you missed something right away. And it will be on YouTube hopefully tomorrow along with the source code on GitHub. If you want to see more of this stuff, go to patreon.com slash brekkies. And without further ado, bye guys. Thank you so much. You're awesome. Keep being awesome. Bye. Thanks to all of the awesome Patreon supporters who donated in October. And a special thanks to Sultan Elshadif, Faisal Marify, and James Kelhound. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash brekkies.